thanks for joining us. Another one of our uh, Safer at Home series talks. Um, nice to have you with us tonight. Um, before we get started, uh, a couple things. Just want to remind everyone that our, all our talks are brought to you by Cape Cod 5, Citizen Federal Credit Union, and Martha's Vineyard Savings. Um, all our books are available at Eight Cousins Bookseller in, in Falmouth. So we hope you uh, uh, per, uh, partake of the locals. Um, if you got any questions at the end, make sure you use the chat feature and, let, and mute yourself so we can hear our speaker. And I'm, um, and um, our speaker tonight. This is her first book, and um, and she's coming to us from a um, a nicer suburb in, in of of Chicago than I grew up in. I think even my parents would agree. Uh, so um, uh, she comes from um, so. But she's no stranger to Massachusetts. She went to Harvard. She's going. She's currently uh, uh, enrolled at Harvard Law School. But she's taking a break to uh, for to talk about her book. So I'm 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 saving her for uh, from doing some studying for for law school, and I'm saving her for watching the Cubs tonight. So would you welcome our guest, Catherine Grace Katz? Thank you so much, Mark. It's so nice to meet you and to meet all of you. I, uh, it's, I, we've been talking about doing this for a long time, so it's great to, to be able to join all of you this evening. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, yes, I uh, am very familiar with Boston and the whole Boston area, having spent, uh, gosh, about five years living there now. Uh, as an undergrad at Harvard, I graduated in 2013, and as a current student at Harvard Law School, though I am currently in Winneka, Illinois, uh, spending some time with family, so very glad we have the technology to be able to do this this evening. Uh, so I thought I'd start by showing a couple of photographs, uh, give you a little bit of uh, information about the background of the story, the story behind the story, kind of how I came to write it, and uh, tell you about a few of the figures in particular. And then uh, at the end, I'd love to uh, answer any questions that you may have. So I'll get started by sharing my screen and showing a couple of pictures. So I love to start with this photograph from the Yalta Conference. This is one of the most famous pictures from World War II. Uh, it shows Churchill, FDR, and Stalin with their military advisors behind them in the courtyard of Lavadia Palace in February 1945. And I, you, know, you can tell a lot about what's going on from this picture just by looking at their faces, you know, the grimaces uh, on each of their faces. You can see they're carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders. And part of the reason for this is because of you know, the issues that they've come to Yalta to, to discuss. By the winter of 1945, it looks like the war in Europe will finally be winding down sometime in the late spring or early summer. The Battle of the Bulge has just ended by the time they all arrive at Yalta. And so the time has come to discuss what will ha happen in the post-war period. Uh, how will they treat Germany after this is all over? Should Germany be allowed to remain one nation or will it be broken up into a group of smaller states in hopes that they won't rise up as a belligerent for a third time in half a century? Also extremely important, especially to Winston Churchill, is Polish sovereignty. Britain went to war to defend Poland at the very beginning, and he wants to make sure that when this is all over, he doesn't return home to see his colleagues, uh, the Polish government in exile in London. He doesn't want to tell them that they haven't succeeded uh, to, in defending that which they, they went to war uh, for at the very beginning. Stalin, however, has some other ideas. He has Psy on his neighbors to the West. They have been in the Soviet Union and the Russian Empire before has been invaded multiple times through the flatlands of Poland dating back to the Napoleonic era. So Stalin wants to make sure that he has, as he calls it, friendly neighbors on his borders. That the government in, uh, in Poland is gonna be friendly for the interests of the Kremlin. FDR, meanwhile, has his eye a little bit more on the Pacific. The war in the Pacific is not as far progressed as the war in Europe. Uh, and he's looking at a potential, you know, need to have an invasion of the, uh, the Japanese home islands uh, with the potentially could uh, lead to the deaths of 200,000 American soldiers and it could take another 18 months. He doesn't yet know if the atomic bomb and the Manhattan Project will be a success. So he's looking to the Soviets uh, to enter the war in the Pacific. The Soviets and the Japanese have had a pact of neutrality since the very beginning of the war and he wants them to break this pact in exchange for some territorial concessions. Meanwhile, he also has a personal goal, and this is to succeed where Woodrow Wilson failed at the end of World War I with the League of Nations. And Roosevelt wants to create a peace organization, uh, the, the United Nations organization, which he sees as not only a way to guarantee peace in Europe for at least 50 years, uh, but perhaps more importantly even to bring the Soviet Union into the international community after the common enemy has been defeated. 
what I didn't really think about until I wrote this book was just what it took to get to Yalta and the, the way that that influenced what came uh, during the conference. I like to show this map because this really gives you perspective of how onerous a journey it was. Uh, at this point, Stalin recognizes that uh, his partners need him more than he needs them. And so if they want to meet, they're going to have to come to him in the Soviet Union. He refuses to leave his, uh, his borders. He doesn't want to leave his security apparatus behind. Uh, he claims it's because his doctors advise him that it's bad for his health to travel. Meanwhile, Roosevelt is actually dying of congestive heart failure. And yet he and Churchill agree to make this trip all the way out to the Crimea. For Churchill, this means flying first 1,300 miles to Malta, where he'll rendezvous with Roosevelt uh, before they head off to the Crimea. And on the way to, to Malta, very tragically, uh, a plane of uh, members of the British delegation goes down off the coast of Italy, and several members of the Foreign Office are killed. It really casts a shadow over the beginning, beginning of the conference for the British. Roosevelt, meanwhile, makes a journey by ship across the Atlantic Ocean in a destroyer convoy, and they're still sighting enemy U-boats as they're uh, traveling to Malta. And it's just remarkable thinking about you know, in the world today, you have uh, these meetings and these summits between world leaders, which are planned months and even you know, years in some cases in advance where every uh, detail of security and safety is overseen. But it is incredibly physically dangerous for them to even attend the Yalta conference. Once they rendezvous in Malta, they have to fly then over uh, enemy occupied islands where they're anti aircraft units uh, that uh, are capable of shooting at their uh, low altitude unpressurized planes before they finally land in the Crimea on an airfield that is far too short for the kinds of planes that they're flying and then have to drive for their six hours over battle scarred roads before they finally arrive at Lavadia Palace on the shore of the Black Sea. Lavadi Palace it once was a very beautiful and it was the home, the summer home of Tsar Nicholas II and his family. It really was a, a family home away from the pressures of court life where they did what normal families do. You know, they went swimming, they played tennis, uh, rode horses, visited the local bazaar. But of course, all this changed after the Russian Revolution in 1917. The Soviets nationalized the palace. They turned it into a rest home for favored Soviet workers. Uh, and uh, when the Nazis invaded the Crimea uh, earlier in the war, they used the, they used Lavadia Palace as their Crimean headquarters. The Soviets pushed them out several months before the Yalta conference. And uh, when they did, however, the Nazis decided to strip the palace of everything they could carry. They took all of the furniture, the lamps, the rugs, the dishes. They even you know, stripped out the, the doorknobs, which they could melt down and use as scrap metal. So the Soviets have just three weeks from the time that all three parties agree this is where going, they're going to have the conference to turn this ransacked uh, palace into a site fit for one of the most important meetings in the 20th century. The Russians do what they do best. They throw manpower at the situation. They take the contents of grand hotels in Moscow, like the Hotel Metropole, and put it on trains and cart it a thousand miles south and frantically restock the villa. Or they simply requisition everyday items like coat hangers and ashtrays out of the homes of local people whose lives have been pretty summarily destroyed by the fighting in the area. And so it just goes to show that while this is a beautiful palace uh, on, the, on the surface, the facade masks a much more challenging and darker reality uh, underneath the surface. And I think this is somewhat uh, of a metaphor for the Soviet Union in general, uh, especially at this time. I like to, you know, kind of also use this picture to show you not only is there so much that going on behind, you know, this, this image, the one that's so famous you see in your history textbooks or on the cover of books about the war, but also to show it in uh, pair with another photograph. This is a, a photograph taken of almost the exact same moment, the same scene, and here you can see a different vantage point. And you can actually see there are two young women standing off to the side of the photograph. This is, uh, of course, not in the, the photograph that we all think that you know, we know so well, but in reality, these women have just been outside of the field of view the entire time. In this picture, you can see Sarah Churchill and Kathleen Harriman, uh, the daughters of Winston Churchill and the American ambassador to the Soviet Union, Avril Harriman. And of course, there was a third daughter, Anna Roosevelt, who's just outside the frame of this photo, but you can see her in newsreel footage of the same scene. And looking at these two photographs, it made me stop and think, you know, here's this moment in history that we think we know everything about. And yet there, there are subtle nuances to it that sometimes you know, we don't, they're not revealed until events in our own time perhaps make us think about history in a different way. So we have you know, these great men of history and of all the people that they could have taken with them at this conference to serve at their, at their aides, I mean, thank you, why did they choose their daughters? What was so unique about their skills and experiences that made these women the perfect partners to serve as their father's right-hand men at this, uh, this incredibly important moment on the precipice between World War and Cold War? 
But perhaps even more importantly, it made me stop and think, you know, here are these great men of history who would put on a pedestal almost to the extent that they, they lose their humanity, they become larger than life. And yet at the end of the day, they're also someone's dad. And what would it be like to be their child, especially at a moment like this? Before we get to, to the daughters, uh, I want to introduce you to uh, another uh, young lady. Uh, this is me in third grade. And I think it was safe to say that uh, I knew I would be a historian pretty early in life, uh, partly because we had a, a wonderful school system here in uh, Winnaka, Illinois, where I grew up, where we were really able to engage with history in a very immersive way. Uh, part of the local history here is, of course, the, the history of the pioneers in the Midwest. And we got to go and live like pioneer students for a day in third grade really put ourselves in the shoes of the people who came before us and imagine what life might have been like for the people our own age uh, living you know, over 100 years ago. And it's uh, also kind of really fit with the, many of the things that I was very excited about as a little kid. My favorite movies were uh, The Sound of Music and White Christmas and The Great Escape. And uh, I used to chase my grandfather around at Thanksgiving asking him to tell me his stories about serving in the Navy during World War II. And I also grew up in a family where uh, reading was uh, very important, was something that we all shared together. Uh, my mom read to us every night before bed and she would read uh, aloud to us on afternoons in the summer on the porch. These are some of my favorite memories. You know, we'd read so many wonderful series like uh, the, the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, read uh, Secret Garden, Anne of Green Gables, uh, Little House on the Prairie, Harry Potter, everything. And these, uh, these you know, really formative life experiences, I think, really shaped the way that I thought about history and uh, you know, life moving forward. It came as a surprise to no one when I went to college and became a history major. This is me uh, my, in my senior year at Harvard, uh, the morning that I turned in my thesis. Um, my roommate thought it was hilarious that I had 115 books checked out from the library. So she decided to take a picture of me with all my books. But um, I really enjoyed writing my thesis at Harvard because it uh, gave me a chance to explore one of the things that I'd loved as a, a kid, the great escape, looking at the stories of British prisoner of war uh, escapees and the, the place of those stories in British culture, kind of akin to American Western heroes uh, here in our literature. But it also gave me a chance to get to know Winston Churchill in a context that's a little different than how most people think about him, especially you know, at the outset of their studies. And uh, what was really unique was that Churchill actually wrote the first of what we think of as these escape stories. He escaped from a Boer POW camp during the Boer War in 1899 uh, at age 24. And it was the story of his thrilling escape which rocketed him to fame in England and really launched his political career. I soon found myself spending uh, more time unexpectedly with Winston Churchill and uh, sooner than I, I thought I would. Uh, after graduating, I had the opportunity to attend Cambridge and for someone who loves history, there really is no better place to immerse yourself in this historical environment everywhere you turn. I was writing my, uh, my graduate dissertation on the origins of modern counterintelligence practices, looking at the postal censorship initiative during World War I, where they uh, tried to read all the inbound and outbound foreign mail to uncover any enemy spy rings in their midst. And the person at the head of this uh, was Winston Churchill, who was then serving as the Home Secretary. So I had spent two years uh, studying Churchill, uh, albeit not during the Second World War, um, but uh, much more time with Churchill than I had anticipated. And that kind of uh, led to uh, some unexpected things that were soon to come. After graduating, I decided to uh, unfortunately <laughs> trade in this idyllic, beautiful Cambridge for the hustle and bustle of New York City doing what many recent grads do, you know, thinking they're doing the smart thing by moving to New York to work in finance, uh, which I did. Uh, but by sheer coincidence, in the lobby of my office was a bookstore called Chartwell Booksellers, which is named after Winston Churchill's country home. And it is the only bookstore in the world that specializes in books by and about Winston Churchill. And I found myself on afternoons and I, just, I missed history and couldn't take the Excel modeling anymore that you know, I'd be, you'd say I was going down to the lobby to get a coffee, but really I was just going into the bookstore and chatting with the owner about history and Winston Churchill. And before long, he kindly offered to introduce me to the International Churchill Society, which is made up of scholars and academics, and uh, but professionals from all walks of life who want to encourage people to study and engage with history uh, and careers in public service in the spirit of Winston Churchill. Coincidentally, uh, they were having a dinner shortly uh, after this uh, suggestion uh, across the street from my office at the Waldorf Hotel featuring Madeleine Albright as their keynote speaker. I was very excited about this, you know, I get a chance to hear the former Secretary of State, uh, but little did I know that I would also have the chance to meet several members of the Churchill family at this dinner. 
And shortly thereafter, I learned that they were opening the papers of Churchill's middle daughter, Sarah, to outside researchers for the first time. The Churchill Society asked if I'd be interested in writing an article about them. Um, they thought that, it, you know, having studied at Cambridge, her papers are back at Cambridge, it would be something I'd be interested in. And I was really looking for a way to continue to engage with history and writing. I had always wanted to be a writer. I just thought that wouldn't be something I'd be able to do until much later in life. Uh, I was uh, applying to law school at the time, thought that's where I was headed. And so uh, off I went to Cambridge, the first chance I had to read about Sarah and learn about her life. But the other reason I was very excited about this is because I had had a, a sort of um, interaction of sorts, I suppose, <laughs> with Sarah, uh, Sarah Churchill for, uh, from the time I was a very little kid. Because every summer, my family goes to the cloister at Sea Island, Georgia, and on the wall of the lobby of the cloister is a beautiful picture of Sarah Churchill on her wedding day uh, in 1949. She had eloped there with her second husband, Anthony Beecham. Uh, it caused quite a scandal, as you can imagine. Um, but this picture from Sarah's wedding at Sea Island has hung on the wall ever since. And I have you know, been seeing this picture every time I walked through, through uh, the cloister since I was literally a baby. And it's just kind of one of these funny coincidences once again. The more that I got to know about Sarah and her life, the more fascinated I became. Most people who know about Sarah today uh, remember her uh, as having been an actress who even starred in a movie with Fred Astaire in 1951 called Royal Wedding. But and while her, her acting career was fascinating, especially for a young woman of her, her class and era who wanted to carve out a career for herself, you know, acting was one of the few uh, things that she found that she could do kind of within the, the structures of her society. But I found myself really interested in her relationship with her father, especially uh, in the context of her wartime career. Sarah and Winston were very close from the time she was a little girl. She used to say that she could uh, walk in silent step with him, following along with his every thought, even if he wasn't speaking, uh, just knowing implicitly what was in his mind. And some of this was uh, fostered over the long hours they would spend together in the garden outside their home Chartwell, where Churchill would br build brick walls in the garden as a, a way of relaxing, and Sarah would be out there with him for hours uh, as his, uh, his uh, right-hand man. Sarah was very much like her father, had a lot of his spirit in wanting to carve out a place for herself in the world and make her own name on her own terms. But when the, the war broke out, she decided to set aside her hard-won career as an actress uh, and do her part for her country by joining the Women's Branch of the Royal Air Force, where she served as an intelligence analyst, looking at reconnaissance photographs that had been taken by pilots thousands of feet in the sky and making intelligence assessments, uh, things like trying to determine what type of enemy ships were in a harbor based on the kinds of shadows that they cast. Uh, she was very intimately involved with the details of operations in the Mediterranean, specifically Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa. And sometimes she even knew the details of these operations even better than her father did, much to his great amusement and great pride. But Sarah had another really interesting aspect of her wartime work. Early in the war, Winston and his wife Clementine had decided that when he traveled abroad for his meetings, someone from the family should go with him as a, a confidant and protector of sorts, but also as an unofficial family historian. They knew that he would want to write his wartime memoirs after it was all over, much as he had done after the First World War, and someone needed to go with him to record kind of the, the unofficial things going on at the conference outside of the, the minutes of the official meetings. And for several reasons, Sarah was the perfect person to go with him. First, uh, she would be working in a diplomatic environment, and there's actually a lot of similarity between acting and diplomacy, and her career as an actress would set her up very well to function confidently in that type of environment. She also had a, an astute political mind, a really keen grasp of both domestic politics and the, the details of the, the wartime operations from her time as a, as a WAF. Um, she really was a brilliant political thinker, much like her father, and perhaps had she been born even 10 years later, she might have succeeded him in politics. But she was also a beautiful writer and had her father's gift for language. And in her letters to her mother, you can just hear her eloquence and her ability to capture everything going on around him. And so uh, off she went to uh, first the Tehran Conference in 1943 to serve as his aide de camp as a, a daughter diplomat of sorts. And there, two other fathers took notice of just how valuable a daughter diplomat could be. The first of these fathers was April Harriman. He was the recently appointed uh, um, uh, American ambassador to the Soviet Union after having served the last two years as Roosevelt's Lend-Lease envoy in London, where he became very close with Churchill and his family. 
Avril Harriman uh, was dashing and handsome and also incredibly wealthy. He was the chairman of Union Pacific Railroad, the uh, founder of Brown Brothers Harriman, the banking firm, owned Newsweek magazine, and he also fun, uh, founded Sun Valley, the first glamorous American ski resort, which he created to bring Americans out west and use his trains by giving them a glamorous destination. And it was at Sun Valley that Avril Harriman developed a really unique partnership with his daughter, Kathleen. Kathleen and Avril were not especially close when Kathleen was a little girl. He was always off chasing business uh, opportunities. And uh, uh, Avril and his wife uh, divorced when Kathleen was a little girl. But after Kathleen's mother died when she was a teenager, she and her father began to get to know one another in a, a really uh, special way. Avril Harriman was not a warm and fuzzy father by any means, but he was very ahead of his time in the sense of wanting to involve his daughters in his world and his professional life to whatever extent it interested them. And he was very encouraging of them uh, taking steps forward in this world. Kathleen's older sister, Mary, uh, was not as interested in a, a career uh, like his, but Kathleen was very adventurous. Uh, she and her father shared this thrill of adventure. They were both great athletes. Uh, Kathleen was even uh, an Olympic level skier, having been the alternate for the what became the canceled 1940 uh, Olympic ski team. And Kathleen and her father built a unique partnership uh, through their shared love of Sun Valley. Kathleen would spend her college vacations working with him really as his right hand man uh, in Sun Valley. And it was this that gave them the foundation that would take them through the war years. Avril Harriman uh, was tapped by FDR to become the Lendley Bonvoy before the United States entered the war. So off he went to London and he arranged for Kathleen to come with him as a war reporter. Uh, she was just 23 years old and the blitz was raging, but off she went uh, to have this incredible adventure of a lifetime in London. She and her father became very friendly with the Churchill family. Uh, one Churchill in particular, uh, Pamela Churchill's uh, uh, daughter-in-law, who was two years younger than Kathleen, the two girls quickly became best friends. But soon Kathleen realized that uh, her best friend Pamela had some other intentions as well, and it was that Pamela and Avril had become an affair. Um, but they were the two families were so close that they were even celebrating Kathleen's 24th birthday on December 7th, 1941, when the two families learned the news about Pearl Harbor. In 1943, Harriman became the ambassador to the Soviet Union. Kathleen decided to continue her adventure at his side. Uh, they really were more, almost in a sense, like business partners or colleagues and father and daughter at this point. She decided to learn to speak Russian for both of them and became in many ways his assistant ambassador. And she became the American woman who had more access to and experience with Stalin in his inner circle than any other American woman in history. Uh, so close in fact that this is a, a picture of Kathleen with a horse that was gifted to her by Stalin. Uh, at the end of her, her time in Moscow with her father. Kathleen was the perfect person to go with Avril to the Yalta Conference. By speaking Russian, she could serve as a liaison between the Soviet and American advanced teams as they were preparing Lavadia Palace for the conference, making sure it was all accessible for Roosevelt, uh, who was paralyzed and in a wheelchair, and even doing things like helping to bridge the cultural divide between the Americans and the Soviets, writing briefing pamphlets for the Americans who were coming who had never come to the Soviet Union before. The third daughter was Anna Roosevelt. And uh, Anna, uh, so Sarah Churchill was 30 years old, Kathleen was 27, and Anna was 38. And she was the, the oldest of the three daughters and also the only mother. But uh, despite that, she was actually the least experienced of the three daughters in this kind of high diplomatic world. Anna and FDR were very close when Anna was a little girl. And I love this picture of the two of them. Not only is it charming and adorable, but also it's uh, one of the few that we have of FDR standing, which I think is just a, a different perspective that we don't see very often. And FDR and Anna, they really had this shared passion for the natural world and the environment when Anna was a little girl. Some of her favorite memories were going on horseback with him uh, around their, their lands in uh, the Hudson River Valley, and he would teach her about conservation and ecology, and this is something that she, she loved. All of this changed uh, when he was paralyzed from polio, and suddenly Anna found herself constantly held at an arm's length and on the outside looking in as all of his advisors and doctors and nurses were constantly surrounding him. Anna was sent away to boarding school, then forced to become a, a debutante, as she said, despite the, the ridicule her parents had for that uh, traditional world. 
She spent a little bit of time at Cornell before leaving to make a rebellious marriage uh, at just 20 years old. Uh, she had two children and sadly the marriage quickly broke down, but she fell in love again soon after on the campaign trail when FDR was running for president with a Republican journalist. So you think about the, the, the partisan divide in our times today, but you can see, you know, even then uh, love can conquer all and cross the political divide. And then her second husband, John Buttiger, moved out to Seattle uh, where they had a, another baby and became the editors of the Seattle Post Intelligence through newspaper. In 1943, John decided to join the army and shipped out to the Mediterranean. So Anna decided to move home. And home at this point meant the White House. So she arrives at Christmas 1943 where she begins to notice something is not quite right about her father. He seems to be having trouble uh, you know, catching all the details. He's sitting there with his mouth hanging open, almost like he can't get enough air. Just little things that you know, on the, their own might not be alarming, but in total, she was very concerned. So she insisted that he have a comprehensive medical examination. And this medical examination revealed that he was in fact dying of congestive heart failure for which there was no cure. Anna and the doctor were sworn to secrecy. They were the only people who knew about his condition. And even FDR didn't want to know what was wrong with him. He never once asked about his diagnosis. And you can imagine he's trying desperately to win the war. Any sense of your own mortality could, uh, could impede this in, 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 tremendously. So it fell to Anna to carry the burden of this secret. And so she became his gatekeeper at the White House, uh, helping to decide who really needed an audience with the president and who could meet with someone else even going so far as to sometimes take papers out of his inbox at night and distribute them to others who could handle them. Anna had long wanted to come with FDR on one of his uh, overseas uh, meetings, as Sarah Churchill had, for example, at the Tehran conference, but FDR had always uh, held her at an arm's length, uh, all interested in choosing to bring her brothers previously. Uh, Anna had four year younger brothers. She was the oldest and the only daughter of Franklin and Eleanor. And FDR used his, his sons in this, these, uh, these moments to help him you know, physically to, to stand and move around you know, when he, he traveled abroad. But Anna, she, she didn't understand why she, she couldn't come and help as well. And finally, in January of 1945, she realizes that she has her chance. Even though FDR doesn't know what's wrong with him, he knows that Anna's doing something to protect him. And so he cables his friend Winston Churchill and says, if you're thinking of bringing Sarah again to this conference, I'm thinking of bringing my daughter Anna. Anna finally at long last has the opportunity to recapture this closeness that she remembered with her father from the time she was a little girl. And she knows that this trip with him is not only, you know, it's the culmination of this desire to, to be his right hand man, but also she knows that he's dying and this is likely her last chance to be at his side and to be the person uh, of highest importance to him uh, probably for, for the last time in her life. I love this photograph of the three daughters together. You can see each of their, their distinct personalities. You have Sarah in her, her officer's uniform, uh, Anna in the middle in a, a sensible tweed and Kathleen in a glamorous fur coat. And even though they all had different responsibilities and reasons that made them so valuable to their fathers at Yalta, they all occupy a similar position as daughter diplomats where they're not there in an official capacity as someone from the State Department or Foreign Office might be, but there is there as a kind of quasi official members of the delegation where they speak with the weight of their fathers behind them, which allows them to go places and hear things and gather information that others might not be able to. They can, you know, have you deliver subtle messages uh, with a lot of nuance and collect information and bring it back to their fathers. They're also able to go out into the local community and meet the people living you know, in the, the, the Crimea and the nearby towns whose lives have been devastated by the war and whose futures are literally being reordered by the conference negotiations taking place. I also you know, think that they really embodied a sense of the future for their fathers at the conference. Here they are, the, you know, the physical embodiment of the next generation, reminding them of what, what is at stake and what the world might be. And it's just a, you know, a, a sense of also a, a real human side of some of these moments in history that are you know, these lofty geopolitical events which feels so removed from our daily lives today. We don't know what it's like to negotiate across the table from Stalin, but you know, we do know what it's like to be somebody's child or to be somebody's parent. And I think that those relationships are truly at the basis of all of these historical moments, even the ones that seem so you know, unrelated to our lives today. You know, people are people and they always have been throughout history and always will continue to be. And I think that seeing this perspective of the Yalta Conference through some you know, very different, different eyes 
and uh, in a much more human and emotional way, it makes us realize that history is really not, not so far away after all. I just wanted to close, uh, I'll stop my uh, screen share there and uh, just add a, a few more things. Just thinking about kind of the context of the Yalta conference today and these, uh, the experience of these three women and what that can teach us about our world now. And one of the things that comes to mind is, you know, after the last two election cycles, we've seen family members being involved in uh, elected officials, public duties uh, in a different way than uh, we have uh, for, for a long time perhaps ever. And so it really prompts the question of what is the appropriate role for the unelected family members to play uh, in their uh, public duties? You know, is there some blanket rule? Should we you know, have there be an official role for an adult first child like uh, we have for the first spouse? Uh, or is it something different? First children have been involved in administrations dating back to John Quincy Adams. Uh, his son was a principal private secretary, and this has happened many times throughout history, but, you know, the a principal private secretary is more of a logistical role, not so much a policy role. Uh, so what are we comfortable with? Uh, on the other extreme, you have Ivanka Trump taking meetings herself at the G20, which, you know, on the surface perhaps seems similar to these daughters at Yalta, uh, but the daughters who attended the Yalta conference didn't have the security clearances to sit in on these meetings. They knew they didn't have the experience for that, but that doesn't mean that they weren't very important to their fathers in other extremely tangible ways. And so I think that's a, a conversation that we should have as Americans, kind of what is the appropriate role for the, uh, the family to play uh, in, uh, in public life. The second thing that I think about, you know, even more so today, kind of growing in importance every day, is the relationship between you know, the American president or the British prime minister and the Russian leader, you know, whether it's the Soviet times, <laughs> the, the post-Soviet times. Uh, I think there's long been this desire to try to build a personal bridge between uh, the East and West. And uh, FDR really believed in his powers of personal persuasion, had a lot of confidence in his ability to, as he said, uh, carry out touchy-feely politics as kind of human-to-human -human connection. And this was very successful in dealing with Churchill. It really was their personal friendship that was the, the underpinning of the, the special relationship. But when it came to Stalin, that wasn't quite as successful. And through the eyes of uh, Anna Roosevelt, you can really see FDR trying and failing to build this personal bond with Stalin as a, an attempted breakthrough in diplomacy. Since then, we've had subsequent administrations. I mean, even as recently as the Bush, Obama, and Trump administration, all trying to forge this personal bond with uh, Vladimir Putin, and it just has not been successful. So instead of relying, kind of a defaulting back to that, that you know, leader to leader uh, relationship, which might be more successful in other countries. Uh, with the Russians, maybe it's a, a better strategy to find areas of mutual cooperation, but not really have uh, that reliance on the person-to-person the -person connection. And finally, uh, while I'm so glad that we have the technology to be able to all gather this evening on Zoom, I think that the importance that Churchill and Roosevelt felt about having the meeting with Stalin in person really goes to show the importance of in-person diplomacy. And things like you know, the United Nations, FDR's commitment to creating this world peace organization, uh, where diplomats and uh, policymakers from all around the world could gather together to expedite diplomacy, to bridge those cultural divides by getting to know one another. I think it's, you know, while it's great that we have the technology to do this, I hope that in the, the world of foreign policy and diplomacy, we can return to a, a full in-person uh, dialogue as quickly as possible. So uh, I think I will leave it there, and uh, I would uh, love to answer any questions that you may have. So please uh, jump in with the, the chat. And um, thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you, Catherine. That was great. Um, did all three of the daughters keep notes, keep diaries? Um, um, and if so, were you able to compare all three and, and, and say, I mean, did they have do they have different takes on the same thing or, um, or, or what, how did they differ? How are they, how are they similar? They did. I have three very distinct personalities shine through in their letters and diaries. Sarah Churchill was largely writing to her mother Clementine during the conference, Kathleen Harriman to uh, Pamela Churchill, uh, to her former governess, uh, who she called Moosh, and to her older sister Mary. And Anna Roosevelt was writing to her, mostly to her husband, uh, but also she was uh, keeping a diary during the time she was there, breaking a personal rule that she had in the White House where she wouldn't keep a diary so that everything uh, that happened there could remain confidential. But she uh, decided to break her own rule 
knowing that she was living through a significant moment in history and she wanted to share the details with that with her husband and children when she returned home. So yes, so we have uh, information, uh, firsthand accounts from all three of them. And they, they are all such different characters. Sarah is such an eloquent and observant writer. She made my job so easy. Kathleen is so American in her, her fresh take and kind of you know witty uh, flippancy kind of on, on life uh, taking place around her, very bold and daring and uh, uh, brimming with confidence. Uh, Anna Roosevelt, uh, even though she was the oldest of three daughters, had the least experience in environment. You can see some of the personal insecurities that she felt there. Uh, meanwhile, dealing with the, the emotions of knowing that her father was dying and not being able to tell anyone. Meanwhile, trying to keep all of his advisors who wanted to meet with him at bay, even Winston Churchill, who was trying desperately to get one-on-one -on -one time with him, and Anna kind of trying to manage all of this uh, with very little help from FDR. It's just fascinating seeing her kind of butt head sometimes even with his closest and longest uh, advisors like Harry Hopkins. And so from each of them, you, you can see, while it is tempting to think of the three daughters as kind of a, you know, a, a unit, you know, three girls against the world, you can really clearly see from their letters that their first priorities, for, first and foremost, were you know, protecting their fathers and representing the interests of their countries. And even though Britain and the United States were you know, the closest of, closest of allies, the priorities are a little bit different at the conference. And you can see, especially Sarah Churchill and Anna Roosevelt being very frustrated kind of with their respective countries interactions. Sarah feeling very frustrated with Anna that uh, she is kind of repeating FDR's line that we only have a few days here, so we need to wrap up business and then go on to other meetings elsewhere. Sarah saying, as if there's anything more important in the world right now than this meeting and coming to, you know, reaching agreements. But of course, you know, Anna can't tell her the reason that she wants FDR to, to get on with things quickly is to, to save, you know, extend his life and to save his energy. And then, you know, Anna and Kathleen also kind of the interpersonal relationships within the American delegation as the opinions are differing on how to deal with Stalin and the Soviet Union. Um, you can see Avril Harriman kind of caught in the middle between Churchill, his, his good friend from London and FDR, his boss. The Brits have a much more skeptical view of Stalin than do the Americans, uh, with the exception of someone like Harriman, who's been on the ground there, kind of coming back at four o'clock in the morning after having these you know, frustrating meetings with Vyacheslav Molotov and Stalin, where they're just intractable. And so he confesses this to his daughter late at night over games of physique. And uh, so it's just, you can kind of see them in the middle feeling very caught in this, uh, this difficult situation. And Sarah Churchill saying being so frustrated with FDR that he doesn't have the same view of Stalin and his intentions towards Poland as Churchill does and has fond memories of him uh, at the Tehran conference. She, she really admired FDR, but as soon as she saw him again at Yalta, she noted in a letter to her mother, it was he sick or has he moved away a bit from us? And really the reality was both. And she was you know, very uh, observant in, in noting that. And so it's just fascinating to see the very clear personalities shining through uh, in all of their letters. Was it easier for the fathers, I guess in this particular case, Darren Churchill and Roosevelt, but Harriman as well, easier for them to deal with their daughters as opposed to their spouses in this particular time? I'm obviously you have a different relationship with Clementine and with Eleanor than you've got with your daughters, but was this was this one time where it was just helpful to have a, a, a have the kid along as opposed to having the, uh, the spouse along? Yeah, that's a great question. And for each of them, it's a little bit different. Uh, Clementine was Winston Churchill's primary advisor, partner. She really you know, was his greatest asset and he recognized this about her. He always came to her for advice and counsel. And they were kind of like a family privy council, kind of, you know, Clementine being you know, the leader of that. And then the, the Churchill, you know, daughters like Sarah and Mary being very involved as well. Clementine was terrified of flying. She tried to avoid traveling, especially by plane as much as possible. So she was very happy to delegate that duty to Sarah. Um, and one of the reasons that also that it was uh, a bit more efficient to bring the daughters was that the Soviets were very gracious hosts and very genuine in you know, wanting to make their guests comfortable uh, and entertain them to the you know, greatest extent possible. But if you brought your wife along, that kind of imposed an additional perceived uh, 
obligation on the Soviets to make it even grander, to have more courses, more banquets, which would take away from the actual working time at Yalta. This is something that FDR told Eleanor uh, when she was devastated to learn that he wouldn't be bringing her on the trip. She was really incredibly hurt by this, especially because both Anna and Eleanor had uh, communicated amongst you know, themselves about FD, their frustration with FDR, you know, both of them wanting to have been involved in the Tehran conference two years earlier, and him, you know, kind of keeping them at arm's length. And they write to each other and say, you know, FDR thinks that it's uh, the woman's place is in the home and that she should be there, you know, keeping the home fires burning. And it's a really different take on FDR. You think of him as being very progressive and a champion of women, but when it came to the women in his own family, it was a little different. At this time, also, you know, he, as for as many, wonderful contributions that Eleanor Roosevelt made to his presidency and you know, the real teamwork that they had. She, her, her energy and zeal for him at this time, I think he felt was counterproductive in a way to kind of preserving the energy that he had and he needed to focus that on Stalin instead of on Eleanor. And so really, you know, sadly, unfortunately at this, this time, he kind of pushes Eleanor aside in, for the sake of self-preservation. And, you know, we can debate whether or not that was the, the, the right thing to do. But he said, you know, just, you know, it'll be easier to take Anna. The, the Soviets won't have to entertain as much. We can work more. But really, it was kind of the, the excuse for trying to protect himself and his energy, even though he didn't know exactly what was wrong with him. He clearly knew that he was not well. Of the three, and I've, you know, you explained in your own personal life that you've had a had a long running uh, interlude with the Churchill family. But of the three, <laughs> did, was was there a favorite of yours? That did you really like uh, learning about this one, or and was there a a, a least favorite? <laughs> <laughs> I like asking you to choose your favorite child. Yeah, something I can't like that, do yeah. that. <laughs> I don't have any children yet, but you know, someday I imagine I, I will not answer that question. <laughs> um, I mean, I I really enjoyed each of them in their own way. You know, as I said, they were really distinct personalities. Sarah made my job so easy just because of what a beautiful, observant, detailed writer she was, and so it was a real joy to work with her material because it was just so artful on its own. Um, just you know, a really lyrical voice. Um, so astute. I almost came to see her as like the conscience of the conference in a way. Kathleen was great fun. I mean, she's someone that modern women will really connect with. She, you know, is a, adventurous and daring. She competes in a, um, a Moscow slalom championship a few weeks after arriving there and takes third place in kind of, you know, you know, old skis and a, a you know sweatshirt that belongs to somebody else and pants that are too big for her and she just kind of attacks life. And she and her father are very similar in this way. Uh, but then on the other hand, uh, part of the price of you know serving as her father's right hand man is that she was exposed to just horrific atrocities during the war, uh, having to go as his representative as the witness to the Kessin Forest massacre, uh, kind of you know evidence gathering of the the Polish officers who'd been murdered and buried in mass graves outside of Smolensk which the Soviets claimed was uh, at the hands of the Nazis. Of course, we now know that the Soviets did it themselves. And so, you know, her kind of trying to, you know, grinning and bearing it and, you know, putting on the best face, you know, it's very classic her. So it's, while she's fun and exciting, there's, you know, a lot more depth there too. For Anna, she was the hardest to write about just because the emotions involved in Anna's life and the choices that she had to make, you know, not only concealing the this true state of her father's health, but also covering up for the affair that he was continuing to have with Lucy Mercer. Um, keeping that from her mother, even though she knew it would crush Eleanor. Um, and while we don't know if it was, you know, an affair in the traditional sense or, you know, more of an emotional betrayal at that point, you know, it's still, he, he was connected to Lucy and this would have, and it did wound Eleanor enormously once she learned of it. But Anna kind of justifying it, you know, covering up for it by doing anything that she could to keep her father alive and kind of, you know, just, how complicated and horrible it would be to be in that position, you know, a position no child should ever have to be in. And so as a writer, the emotional scope of Anna's story gave me a, it was a, a great exercise kind of as a writer to deal with her material, to work through, you know, those hard emotions and just explore this, you know, the scope of 
to the human feelings and how that you know reflects our own lives too. Um, but it was really just personally very exciting to, to work with all this material and get to know them. I was the same age as Kathy when I was working on the bulk of the research for this. She, you know, she was 27 at Yalta. Uh, I published it. It was a few months shy of uh, Sarah's age. Uh, I'm you know, turned 30 now. Sarah was uh, 30 at Yalta. And even just seeing those three years, I feel like I've changed and uh, grown so much personally. You can see the difference between you know a 27-year-old woman and a 30-year-old woman at Yalta and how their perspectives might be a little bit different as well. Um, and so just personally was a, a great pleasure uh, and a joy to be able to to get to know them and to write about you know young women that aren't you know so different in some ways from me. Although of course <laughs> I'm not the daughter of a president or a prime minister. <laughs> I was glad you showed that uh, that map at the beginning of the actual travels. We kind of lose sight of the fact that, yeah, that they they didn't get on a Learjet. You know, they didn't they didn't they, there was there was no supersonic transport. They they had to take it to, and and just how old and frail FDR looks at that time. You know, that you the the little side shot that you did of the daughters in both. Uh, both FDR and and um, and Churchill have a little cigarette in their hand. I don't know if you notice that they're, they're like a little candid moment, but just just the sheer um, uh, travails of getting there. It, you know, um, uh, I'm, I'm sure that had to be nerve wracking for the daughters too. You know, you know what's going on. But um, um, you also put in there a little a little sidebar. <laughs> You know, maybe the most famous or infamous is is, is Pamela Harriman, Pamela Churchill <laughs> Harriman, who's in, and you know, that she, you, you've got a friend of hers who's got to cover up the fact that she's having an affair with her with her husband or with her, with her father. So it's just a, a little a little sidebar. If, if people don't, you, you, you can fill them in on, on Pamela if, you, if you'd like. <laughs> No, I mean, the, the affair between Pamela and Avril Harriman is maybe one of the most famous affairs in history. And of course, you know, they have this romance during the war, they break it off. And then years later, they end up getting married after meeting again, uh, when they're a uh, widow and widower, respectively, after they see each other at a, a dinner at Kay Graham's house in Georgetown. Um, much, much later, you know, she, he's, she's in her late 50s, and he's like about 80 at that time. But uh, during the war, they had this affair. Kathleen is willing to cover up for it. You know, her mother died. She wasn't very close to her stepmother. And she realizes it works to her advantage because it really secures her place in London by lending some respectability to Pamela spending so much time with them. Um, and she really can't be sent home if things get more dangerous because then Avril won't have anyone to cover up for the affair. Um, and it's remarkable also how Kathleen and Pamela did continue a, a genuine friendship throughout this time, even though this is so odd. Um, but the other thing that's really interesting about Pamela is that she wasn't only having an affair with Avril Harriman, she was also having an affair with Edward R. Murrow and Bill Paley, uh, and two other you know, people who actually were at Yalta, including Fred Anderson, who was one of the top uh, American military representatives, and Peter Portal, who was the head of the, the Royal Air Force. Um, Peter Portal is just absolutely besotted with Pamela. He wrote to her every night in this continuous 30 page handwritten letter of everything going on at Yalta, big things, small things, funny things, you know, the dull things, just like a really clear, you know, detailed look at life at the Yalta conference. And the reason that this letter is so great, not only is it you know so long and detailed, but he also wanted to hand deliver it to Pamela as an excuse to see her. And so uh, he goes to see her in London when it's over, carrying the letter with him from Yalta. And the great thing about that is that that letter never went through the censor. And so we have a whole 30 page letter that hasn't been chopped to bits uh, for, you know, we as historians now to be able to work with. And so, <laughs> you know, it seems like Winston Churchill was the only person not having an affair uh, of the participants in the Yalta conference. Sarah Churchill was having an affair with John Gilbert Winant, the American ambassador to, Br to Britain. Uh, Kathleen Harriman had a brief fling with FDR Jr. one time and he came to London. Uh, Avril and Pamela, of course, you know, the, the other Pamela paramours. Uh, Churchill was very devoted to his wife, Clementine. It was a, a, a real love story. But thanks to all these affairs with Pamela, we have so many letters now to, <laughs> to use as historians. Um, so she's kind of the, the character who's there in spirit more than any other. And then I, I suppose uh, Stalin's daughter as well, slightly there in spirit too. And kind of the, the other women who were present but not on the scene. What was Stalin's relationship with, with these women? One of them said you could speak Russian very well. So she had his head, you know, but what, how did, 
Stalin relate to them? Yeah, so, I mean, it wasn't like a, a close friendship by any means. Kathleen would see him, she'd be involved, you know, there'd be, you know, grand affairs taking place you know, in Moscow where Stalin would be there and Kathleen would be there. So she'd have kind of some small interactions. And then Sarah Churchill had met him at the Tehran conference in 1943. And of course had, had never met him before. And he was well aware that the daughters would be coming, you know, very used to seeing Kathleen in Moscow, used to, you know, Sarah having been there at Tehran. Uh, but, uh, the daughters had really interesting takes on Stalin. Kathleen uh, kind of writing to her, to uh, writing home, uh, thinking about something that Avril Harriman had told her, you know, her father told her about negotiating with Stalin where things were going well. He just kind of, he, he was a doodler. So he'd doodle kind of like little harmless doodles on the side of his page and a red pen. But if he became more frustrated and the, the discussion turned tense, and he wasn't getting what he'd wanted, his doodles would become increasingly menacing and he'd start doodling things like wolves on the side of the page. And that's a, a really interesting little observation and kind of a, a, a view of you know, the, the inner workings of Stalin's mind. And then Sarah Churchill having had a couple of experiences now with Stalin. And on the one hand, he was a very jovial and gracious host. You know, he was jocularly referred to as Uncle Joe. And, uh, and so Sarah, she talked about, you know, seeing, you know, his kind of sprightly smile and seems like, you know, this very harmless older gentleman. But then she talked about, you know, if you look into his eyes, they were like cold, hard water. And if I was really, you know, the window to the soul, then I think that that says a lot. But Stalin was, you know, gracious to the daughters on the surface. He toasts them uh, at the grand uh, final banquet, Kathleen in turn gets up and gives a toast in Russian on behalf of the three daughters to Stalin and his, uh, his henchmen. But kind of behind the scenes, other things are going on. Leventry Beria, who's the head of the, you know, the uh, NKVD, the precursor to the KGB, he's there and kind of uh, seeking opportunities to intimidate the daughters. I mean, not in a, he, he was known, now we know that he, he was one of, the, uh, he was truly a monster and one of the worst in history, you know, a serial rapist, murdered so many people. Um, of course, he's not going to do that to the, the daughters of the prime minister and the president, but still seeking ways to undermine their, you know, comfort and kind of get in their heads, kind of some banter with Sarah uh, through an interpreter and then, you know, trying to encourage Anna Roosevelt to drink more and it's just there, there are little things under the surface where it's not coming from Stalin, but it's clearly within Stalin's orbit. What becomes of the of the daughters after this? I mean, we know FDR doesn't have much long to live, but what becomes of the three? Yeah, so um, it, they didn't leave Yalta, you know, being the best of friends. Um, they get along well, um, but again, kind of, First and foremost, they're you know viewing the world through the eyes you know of their father and their country, which doesn't always align. But their lives continue to intersect after the war. Um, Sarah, uh, she goes with her father to like Homo after he loses the general election in 1945, and you know continues to have you know, a lot of you know heart to hearts in these special moments with her dad. She returns to her career as an actress. Uh, uh, Anna Roosevelt's life is completely turned upside down when her father dies on April 12th, 76 years ago yesterday, and the whole world as she knows it uh, as an adult has been her father being president, and that's suddenly gone in an instant, um, and just learning to cope with the, the world without FDR. Kathleen Harriman, uh, she stays with her father uh, in Moscow till the, uh, the, I think, January 1946, and she returns to her work as a journalist working for Newsweek in New York. Um, the three women, though, they, they experienced similar, I, I don't want to give away too much to anyone who hasn't read the book, um, but I'll say that their lives were, are resonant in unique ways where they all experience similar things, you know, similar tragedies occurring, you know, with loved ones uh, as affected by the war in ways that they didn't understand then, things like mental health, which becomes a, a big, a prominent feature, you know, in, the, in their lives and those that they care about later on. And kind of in those moments of shared tragedy where they understand not only what it's like to be one of the few women who had a seat at the table during these these moments, but then also to, to deal with the aftermath of that in a, a very public way where you're always in the public eye. It's, um, you know, they, they think there's some shared solace that they have in, you know, these little communications with each other and years later, kind of knowing that they are some of the only people in the world who know what that feels like. And so it's, 
lovely to see those moments. And then of course the, the Churchills and the heroines will always be bound for eternity in the form of Pamela. Pamela divorces Randolph Churchill. She later married uh, the producer Leland Hayward. After he died, she marries April Herman. Kathleen's one time best friend becomes her stepmother. Uh, things get more complicated. <laughs> I'll leave it there. <laughs> um, how long did it take for you to work on this? Um, and bes besides the obvious caveat that you're in law school, what's next for you? Uh, the whole thing took about three years. Uh, I'd say about a year and a half research, about a year and a half writing. And the final year I was working on this, I was also during my first year at Harvard Law School. Um, so it was a, a year last year of not a lot of sleep, but that's okay. You know, I'd rather have, you know, no sleep in a book than a book and uh, no book and lots of sleep. Um, so I have two more years of law school and I really want to bring history and law together. I think that they go hand in hand and I believe that history should be used as a, as a tool to help us better understand complex challenges that face us in the present, many of which have, you know, really, you know, a strong legal element to them, especially in foreign policy, national security. And so helping use that, you know, that, that lens kind of both of history and law to tackle those complex problems. Uh, I, you know, I still have two years of law school, so uh, it remains to be seen whether I, I practice law in the traditional sense or, or not. Um, I absolutely intend to continue to be a writer first and foremost and have uh, a next book idea in mind, which I'm eager to get started on as soon as the archives reopen. They've been closed for the duration of COVID, which has been uh, a bit frustrating for all of, you know, shared frustration for historians everywhere around the world. So as soon as that, that's possible, I would uh, love to, to dive right in. Um, but, you know, I think that, you know, there, there's so much that is, you know, so many synergies between history and the law, and I really want to find ways to bring those together. And if it's possible someday, years from now, to, uh, to be an advisor, to be a diplomat myself, kind of with those as, you know, the, the skills that I, that I bring, then if I could, you know, someday participate in something like the Yalta Conference, if I had, was so fortunate to be able to, to serve my country in those ways, I would really love to, to have the opportunity to do something like that, you know, many years from now. I want to thank you for taking the time tonight. It has been, this has been great. I, I, um, I wish you great success with, with law school, great success with this book, and great success with, with, um, with representing the country when you do. So, uh, <laughs> so thank you for taking the time tonight. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, if you could do me a favor, try to get the Cubs to hit. And, um, um, and stay safe. Thank you very much for doing this. And um, um, uh, just thanks for taking the time. Thank you so much. I've so enjoyed this. It's so kind of you to have me. Thank you to everyone who, who enjoyed this this evening. I hope you, if you enjoyed it, I hope you did. Um, if you uh, want to stay in touch, I would love for you to, to uh, join uh, my newsletter. I send out some fun things on rare occasions. I can put that in my, in the chat here. Um, there you go. And uh, yeah, we just would, would love to hear from you and uh, just you know, continue sharing stories of history, you know, even in these times when we have more time with family, you know, sit down and uh, ask questions and share stories. And, you know, I, I would love to encourage more people to, to get involved in history, even if that's just in your own living, in your own living rooms. Thank you so much. Good luck. And thanks for taking the time. Good, uh, Thank good, you. Have a great stay night. Safe. Thank you, everybody.